70 years ago, one of the wildest and deadliest tornado outbreak sequences in U.S. history occurred. In just under 72 hours, a potent weather system dropped at least 50 tornadoes across a 1,500-mile stretch of the Midwest and northeastern United States. Three of these violent tornadoes tore through the heart of major cities located well outside of Tornado Alley, resulting in a horrific 251 deaths. In an era prior to the National Weather Service and Dr. Fujita's critical tornado research, increasing concern was voiced over the nuclear bombs being tested out west and their potential impact on summer storm systems to the east. Today, we examine the meteorological conditions that caused this multi-day travesty, investigate the irreparable damage that these tornadoes caused, and observe how this generational event catapulted tornado science into the modern age. Now, if you watch my video on the Fargo tornado of 1957, you have a pretty good idea of where tornado science and weather prediction was in the early 1950s. If you didn't, you should watch it. But to recap, a destructive tornado that tore through Tinker Air Force Base in 1948 kickstarted a government-funded effort to accurately predict tornadoes. Led by Major E.J. Fawbush and Captain R.C. Miller, the project was deemed a huge success when just five days later, a second tornado tore through the Air Force Base, but this time it was accurately predicted several hours before it hit. The ideal condition conditions for tornado development were then laid out in a landmark paper, An Empirical Method of Forecasting Tornado Development, published in 1951. So the fundamental scientific understanding of what causes tornadoes was relatively well understood by meteorologists in the 1950s but the same can't be said for the American general public. The 1950s are widely considered as the golden age of American capitalism. After World War II ended, American families were reunited and a general sense of peace and prosperity swept across the nation. Unemployment was low, wages were comparatively high, and on the surface, everything seemed pretty swell. But beneath that gilded American life lay a simmery anxiety of the social, political, and atmospheric nature. After the US dropped the atomic bomb on Japan, and Nazi Germany surrendered, World War II had ended and the Cold War was just beginning. When the Soviets successfully deployed their first atomic warhead in 1949, all bets were off and a nuclear arms race was officially underway. The United States had established several nuclear weapon testing facilities across the globe, including the Pacific Proving Ground in the late 1940s and the Nevada test site starting in January of 1951. Throughout the next several years, nuclear test shots were conducted in several operations, each operation consisting of 5 to 11 above ground detonations over the course of several weeks to several months. The resulting mushroom clouds were visible over 100 miles away and it became a bit of a tourist attraction to view these detonations from Las Vegas, 80 miles to the southeast. But as these tests continued at a steady pace, the concern for potential environmental and atmospheric impact began to grow. Now, it didn't help that after the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the mayor of Miami Beach, Herbert Frank, urged President Truman to use atomic bombs to break up any potential hurricanes that were heading for the Atlantic coast. Now, regardless of how dumb this idea is, by today's standards, it probably wouldn't have worked anyways. Mount Pinatubo in 1991 erupted right as Typhoon Yunya was hitting the Philippines, essentially shredding that Category 2 storm. But the Mount Pinatubo eruption was 500 to 1,000 times more powerful than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, which pales in comparison. But just because an atomic bomb couldn't be used to destroy a hurricane doesn't mean it can't impact the weather. In 1946, Victor F. Hess, a Nobel Prize winner for his contribution in the discovery of cosmic rays, voiced his concern that the fallout from an atomic bomb could launch particulate matter into the atmosphere, blocking out the sun, somehow creating extended periods of rain and drought. Clearly, at least on the scale that he defined, this was not the case. And throughout the next seven years, the opinions of the scientists and the general public would slowly evolve. And now we arrive to the spring and summer of 1953. And by March, the tornado season was off to a wild start. On March 13th, an F4 tornado killed 17 in Judd and Rochester, Texas. Between April 25th and May 2nd, five individual F4 tornadoes struck from San Antonio, Texas to Warner Robins, Georgia, killing 36. On May 11th, the first officially rated F5 tornado carved through Waco, Texas, killing 114, becoming the deadliest tornado in Texas history. An additional four F4 tornadoes struck the U.S. within the surrounding 48 hours. On May 21st, an F4 tornado hit Port Huron, Michigan in Sarnia, Ontario, killing seven. Looking at this map, you can not only see the unusually large number of violent killer tornadoes throughout the end of May, 
but also the wide spatial distribution of these tornadoes as well, extending as far north as southern Ontario. The general weather pattern that created conditions favorable for that Ontario tornado quietly persisted over the next couple weeks until the storms once again reared their ugly head on June 7th. General warmth and moisture had extended relatively far north along a gradient from southwestern Texas to New England. By June 7th, a surface low had formed along its gradient in southwestern Nebraska, moving northeast throughout the early morning hours. As the low deepened, a cold front extending to the west began pushing counterclockwise around the low center. To the east, the warm air surged northward into eastern Nebraska, Iowa, and Illinois. Temperatures across this area surged into the 80s and 90s while the dew points followed suit. Aloft, a low formed at 500 millibars over northeastern Wyoming, and the winds in the jet stream accelerated around the low, creating a jet streak. A classic central Great Plains setup for severe weather was now established. By 1 p.m., a cluster of storms in eastern Colorado and western Nebraska had blossomed into mature supercells, several of which were producing violent tornadoes. One observer who was driving along Route US 138 near Ovid, Colorado, witnessed twin tornadoes dropping from a singular large rotating wall cloud, as shown by these detailed hand-drawn sketches. At around 3 p.m., one of these supercells produced a tornado that killed the Madsons, a family of 10 gathered to celebrate Sunday dinner just to the east of Arcadia, Nebraska. These supercells remained severe throughout the evening hours as they crossed the Iowa state line, producing 30 other tornadoes in sparsely populated areas. By the early morning hours of Monday, June 8th, the surface low had begun to occlude, racing off to the east towards the Great Lakes. Now, conditions in Ohio and Michigan were cool, dry, and clear as a surface high set over the region. But aloft into the west, things were getting very concerning. The low at 500 millibars was now closed and deepening, with a negatively tilted trough and associated powerful jet streak over Wisconsin and Minnesota. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the term closed low. The term is used to describe a low pressure area with a distinct center of cyclonic rotation, which can be completely encircled by one or more isobars or height contour lines. These systems are usually very deep and vertically stacked, meaning that the fronts tend to be occluded and move at a slower speed. Many times with a closed low, there isn't an associated digging trough, which means that the jet stream doesn't bend around them at a sharp angle, reducing the potential vorticity to the east of the trough. This means less divergence aloft, less rising motion at the surface, and less wind shear. But other closed lows do have strong associated shortwave troughs, which supply ample wind shear for lawn track tornadoes. The associated shortwave trough in this particular setup exhibited a decent negative tilt, which dug further southeast throughout the day, creating that vorticity or spin in the atmosphere on the eastern side. By noon, warm air advection at the surface was well underway, bringing in strong southerly moisture returns from the Gulf of Mexico. Sunshine helped bake the lower atmosphere, allowing temperatures to push past 80 degrees. Meteorologists in the Great Lakes region began to piece together the potential for tornadic activity, but their certainty increased tenfold after plotting an atmospheric sounding taken from Mount Clements, Michigan at 4 p.m. Strong southerly wind at the surface and stronger southwesterly wind five kilometers aloft. Warm, moist air at the surface surface with very dry, cool air aloft, resulting in an alarming 4,500 joules per kilogram of CAPE. Once convection began, there would be no stopping it until the cold front would pass through in the overnight hours. Although tornadic prediction was in its infancy, these conditions were considered somewhat of a textbook scenario, as outlined in an empirical method for forecasting tornado development published two years earlier. By the 7 o'clock hour, a severe weather bulletin was issued encompassing a 50,000 square mile area of the Rust Belt in southern Ontario. The entire area was designated as a zone favorable for severe thunderstorms, while the lower two-thirds was more favorable for tornadoes. Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Buffalo, and Toronto were all included in this bulletin. By this time, discrete supercells were firing along a line extending from west of Bay City to south of Toledo. Now, although we don't have satellite or radar imagery from these storms, we do have the WRF to give us some context. The WRF, or Weather Research and Forecasting Model, is a mesoscale numerical weather prediction model that, when given a list of initial atmospheric conditions, can output simulations of things like radar reflex activity, thunderstorm structure, and storm development. When we input the initial conditions shown 
shown in the Mount Clemens sounding, we obtain this output, a model of what an idealized supercell thunderstorm would look like maturing within that atmospheric profile. A strong updraft with overshooting tops, tilting with height, flattening out into an anvil downwind. A strong downdraft in gust front. When looking at idealized radar reflectivity, we can see a supercell thunderstorm splitting, with the southern storm developing a hook-like appendage. This suggests that if supercells within that developing line had split, then the southern storms were likely the big tornado producers. And speaking of which, large tornadoes were now on the ground. Just after 6 p.m., a violent stovepipe tornado touched down in the far northwestern suburb of Toledo known as Temperance, Michigan, moving east-northeast, destroying over a dozen homes before transitioning into a water spout over Lake Erie. Half an hour later, a supercell along the line to the south produced a stovepipe tornado on the border of Henry and Wood counties. Passing just to the north of the communities of Signet and Jerry City, barns, trees, and vehicles in the tornado's path were yanked from the earth by 200-mile-an-hour winds. As the northern Ohio supercell marched east with violent tornadoes on the ground, the northwesternmost storms in Michigan were just beginning to dominate the moisture-rich environment. There appeared to be maybe three distinct lines or clusters of supercells, and unfortunately this is where we just run into the general lack of data. There was not a lot of radar imagery in 1953 besides the few echo tops visible on defense radars near airports. There were also no operational weather satellites to provide imagery. In fact, the first satellite, Tyros, wouldn't be launched until seven years later. The best thing we can do is draw comparisons from later events that resulted in similar outcomes that occurred in a time when more data was available. And this later event is May 31st, 1985. Occurring several hundred miles to the east, the Niles event shares a lot of the same meteorological conditions. A nearly closed low at 500 millibars, a strong occluded surface low, ample moisture returns at the surface, and a cold front racing to the east. Three distinct clusters or lines of supercells formed in this outbreak. To the north, violent tornadoes struck southern Ontario. To the south and east, violent tornadoes hit eastern Ohio and northwestern PA. And to the west along the cold front, tornadoes impacted eastern Ohio later in the day. The second cluster to the east of the cold front was where the Niles F5 tornado was born. Looking now at June 8th, 1983, we might be able to draw a distinct similarity. This cluster of supercells to the east of the cold front seemed to be the most violent of the bunch. And the tornado that touched down just after 8 p.m. in western Genesee County would end up being one of the most significant tornadoes in U.S. history. A few miles to the east of the tornado was the city of Flint, Michigan. Before the mass deindustrialization and water and financial crisis of the early 2000s, Flint was home to General Motors. In the 1950s, a third of Flint's 150,000 residents worked for the American car manufacturer who was responsible for pumping out many of the class classic Chevys of the era, including the first-generation Corvette. Many of these workers lived in Beecher, a community on the far northern fringe of Flint that offered affordable housing at the time. While many were aware of the general thunderstorms that were impacting the area, few were aware of the large multiple vortex tornado that was now tearing east on Coldwater Road. What you're about to see firsthand is aerial imagery from 1954, showcasing a three-mile stretch of Beecher, Michigan, where an astounding 113 deaths occurred. The first houses to be completely destroyed were the Blight and Bean family homes, resulting in the first deaths. Cars that were driving along Coldwater Road were launched into surrounding fields. To the east on the corner of Ballard Drive was the Gattaca family home, which was ripped off its foundation, killing everyone inside. This picture from Life magazine shows what was left in the immediate aftermath. As the multi-vortex tornado continued down Coldwater Road, it swept up every house on both the northern and southern sides, as well as vehicles that were now desperately trying to outrun the tornado. The problem was, the only escape route for these vehicles was either hightail it as fast as humanly possible east down Coldwater Road, or travel perpendicular down Saginaw Street. But these streets were in heavily populated downtown areas. There was too much traffic, and that reflected in the final death toll. To the east of Detroit Street was the most densely populated area of the Beecher District. The Young family home was reduced to a pile of small planks of wood. Walter Tutkoff's box spring mattress was conveniently wrapped around a tree. Arthur Whaley, who worked at the GM plant, survived the tornado shown standing in the rubble of his home here. Entire families lost their lives within these two-story homes. Despite the unfathomable strength of this tornado, there's one thing that you'll notice about all of these pictures. In the background or off to the side stands the Beecher Metropolitan District Water Tower. 
which was a mere 300 feet away from 250 mile an hour winds. It sustained virtually no damage and acted as sort of an anchor or waypoint when scanning the unrecognizable vast field of tornadic debris. Just to the north of the water tower in the heart of Beecher stood the drive-in movie theater, at which those gathered began to flee once seeing the tornado. This was likely the main source of traffic towards the center of town. The theater was clipped by the tornado, but those in their cars on the road did not survive. It's very difficult to describe the tragedy that occurred along this three-mile stretch of road. While 113 people died, another 500 were injured. Injured as in impaled with a 2x4 wall stud, needing an arm or leg amputation or just missing limbs. People were rendered unrecognizable by this tornado, and it's a very hard thing to talk about, but it needs to be mentioned. The tornado continued east for several more miles, killing three more people, but thankfully the area immediately east of Beecher was much less densely populated. Unfortunately for the Rust Belt, and much like other tornado outbreaks of the time, the night was young, and the supercell that had just produced the Signet tornado had cycled several times and was now moving towards the Cleveland Metro. The great thing about Cleveland is that Hopkins International Airport is located 10 miles southwest of downtown, which is the direction from which many of these lines of super cells approach. So after 9.30 p.m. when the tornado was visible from the air traffic control tower, a warning was immediately disseminated over radio and television broadcasts. So in essence, many people in Cleveland actually had a tangible amount of time to prepare between 10 and 15 minutes. But preparation for an area that never gets hit with violent tornadoes is lackluster at best. Many people really didn't know what to do once they got the warning besides stay put in their homes. Regardless, I wanna point out one interesting thing about this tornado. Take a look again at this photo taken from Hopkins Airport and compare it to the Niles Ohio F5 of 1985. The resemblance is uncanny. Not only is the meteorological setup similar, but the physical structure of the tornadoes are similar as well. Exiting the airport, the tornado spent the rest of its life in a densely populated metro area. Moving through West Park, it swept houses off of their concrete slabs. The stretch of homes between West 130th and West 117th took the brunt of the damage. An infant was lifted from his crib by the tornado and landed 200 yards away. Five residents died in a home along West 28th Street. At the Hippodrome Theater in downtown, the movie It Came From Outer Space was showing as the tornado went roaring past outside. Some people at the theater thought that the shaking was a result of the new surround sound speaker system, an artistic choice made by the audio engineers when in reality a major tornado had barely missed downtown Cleveland. And thus, downtown was spared from the catastrophic damage because the tornado began to weaken as it approached the shores of Lake Erie. This is a somewhat common occurrence in northern Ohio. Sometimes when we get supercells approaching from the southwest, they will make a right turn right as they approach the cooler waters of Lake Erie. The fact that an F4 tornado happened at all in Cuyahoga County is a testament to how volatile the atmospheric conditions were that day. My grandmother was a kid back then and she lived about half a mile from the tornado's path. That started a lifelong fear of severe weather for her, and thankfully that didn't carry over to me. All in all, at least 12 tornadoes struck Michigan and Ohio on the 8th. One F5, two F4s, and likely several unaccounted for smaller tornadoes that were part of larger tornado families. By midnight, the storms had likely congealed into a squall line being propelled by the fast-moving cold front. As the closed low deepened at 500 millibars, it traversed northeastward into Canada. The triple point, the point at which the cold occluded and warm fronts meet, migrated eastward into New England. Despite traveling 2,000 miles, the elevated mixed layer consisting of drier air from Arizona was still warm and dry enough to create these steep lapse rates, allowing for severe thunderstorms and damaging hail. And while usually the moisture for storms is solely supplied from the Gulf, in this situation, a clockwise rotating high was located over Bermuda, pushing warmth and moisture from the central Atlantic into New England, mixing that with the Gulf air. The only real difference between the June 8th and 9th setups was the narrower region of favorable tornadic conditions. Coupled with the mountainous and hilly terrain of northern New England, it was less likely that there would be long track violent tornadoes on the 9th. Despite this, the conditions observed on that day were likely the most volatile tornado prone conditions ever observed in central New England to date, and the meteorologist on site knew this. Everything outlined in Fawbush and Miller's Guide to Tornado Forecasting was clearly present, but the meteorologists were more concerned with public response. They had never issued a forecast including the chance for tornadoes, 
They had never even issued a forecast, including the chance for severe storms. After much back and forth, the weather office decided to issue a forecast for locally severe storms, something that would alarm the public but not send them into a full-blown panic. While one may simply give the meteorologist a pass due to the given context, check this out. This is a circular letter written by Francis Reicheldurfer, the chief of the Weather Bureau, written in 1950. It turns out with most violent tornado outbreaks in this era, the Weather Bureau forecasters would tell the press things like, tornadoes can't be predicted, or we don't have the technology to issue these warnings yet. Well, the thing is, Francis denounces this and reminds the forecasters that although accurately issuing a tornado warning is difficult, it is their duty to do so when the conditions are favorable. He also asks them to avoid any statements that negate the Weather Bureau's willingness or ability to make such forecasts. From all accounts, the decision made by the Weather Office in Boston was in direct conflict with Reicheldorfer's sentiment but it's hard to say how much weight that letter actually carried on the decision-making process in the 1950s. And really, it does no good to ridicule or criticize the difficult decisions that had to be made in lieu of essential weather forecasting technology. But regardless, it is an important part of the story. Back in New England, sunshine in the early morning gave way to explosive thunderstorms with particularly intense hail cores by 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. These thunderstorms first formed to the east of the Green Mountains along the Connecticut River, growing as they moved east-southeast. And here's where we get some awesome data, thanks to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Radiation Laboratory. Primitive 10-centimeter microwave radar systems were able to render fuzzy images of the individual supercells as the tornado first touched down. Given the distance of the tornado from MIT at the time and making many qualitative assumptions about reflectivity and storm structure, we can get a decent enough picture of what the line of supercells actually look like as they marched eastward across New England. The tornado in question dropped from this supercell that was now churning through the rugged forest east of the Quabbin Reservoir. The first deaths were the result of a collapsed farmhouse north of the town of Barr. Containing a weak but apparent multi-vortex structure, it continued through the town of Rutland, where from what I could find, this is considered the first known photograph of a New England tornado taken by Rita Canny. Note the smoky condensation funnel, which was also shared with the Flint and Cleveland tornadoes the day prior. And here is where we get another likely case of New England topographical convergence aiding tornado development. The area to the west of Worcester, Massachusetts, including the Cascades West Conservation Area and Moore State Park, has rolling forested hills of about a thousand feet in elevation. The Worcester Metro to the east sits in a valley at about 500 feet in elevation. Now, it's very possible that the southerly surface winds converged in this area and as a result were stronger in northern Worcester, allowing stronger inflow to the parent supercell and thus intensifying the tornado. We've seen this phenomenon many times with tornado outbreaks in New England, such as the Mechanicville tornado of 1998. Many of these towns are located in north south oriented river valleys, which allow for this low-level moisture convergence. We also obtained another radar image from MIT, this time showcasing the classic hook echo structure of the supercell as the tornado intensified over the town of Holden at 4.55 p.m. And from here, things get really unfortunate. Directly in the tornado's path was the city of Worcester, Massachusetts. Sporting over 200,000 residents at the time, it was the second largest city in all of New England, only getting beaten by Boston. The city hosted a large number of manufacturing plants in the industrial era, including the Norton Company, the country's leading supplier of abrasives for commercial applications. At around 5 p.m., the tornado crossed over the Winthrop Oak subdivision on Edgewood Drive. The small, single-story homes newly built to meet the housing demand of a post-World War II America were picked up by the tornado, pulverized mid-air, and sent flying into the skies of eastern Massachusetts. As there was no official tornado warning, the falling debris in the Worcester Metro area served as a major red flag to those who were watching. The tornado crossed the railroad tracks and wiped out homes along Brentwood Road, debarking trees, sucking residents out of their vehicles through the driver's side window. As the tornado entered the west side of town, it ballooned in size and strengthened, likely a result of subtly convergence in the lower elevations. Howard Smith took this photo of the tornado from Indian Lake when it was less than a mile outside of town. Throughout the next mile stretch of Worcester between West Boylston Street 
Street and St. Nicholas Avenue with some of the worst damage and loss of life ever observed in New England. Assumption College off of Boylston was a Roman Catholic university for men that housed several dozen nuns in a convent on the southwestern side. The tornado clipped the college campus, collapsing the convent and killed two of the nuns. At this point in time, the Blue Hill Observatory, 35 miles to the east, called the weather office reporting debris falling out of the sky. The weather office began writing a tornado warning bulletin, but they wouldn't disseminate it until after the tornado lifted. Many of the homes in the immediate area of Assumption College were stacked triplexes, wide three-story homes, one family per floor. They were erected in large quantities near the turn of the century along the East Coast as an alternative to the row homes commonly found in Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New York. These stacked triplexes were everywhere in Worcester, and while affordable and quite comfortable for living, they were death traps for 200 mile an hour winds. While the lowest level of your home is the safest place to be during a violent tornado, many residents were buried beneath rubble from the floors above them and did not survive. The infamous damage photos you've seen from this tornado likely come from Uncatana and Tacoma Avenues. The multi-vortex tornado, now 1,500 yards wide, swept the entire several blocks clean, causing very gruesome and disturbing casualties to the young residents inside. Many bodies were so disfigured they could not be properly identified until much later. A 25,000 pound public transportation bus was launched into the air, killing two passengers inside. Henry Le Parade on Wells Street took this photo of the tornado as it skirted the edge of Lake Quinsigamond, roughly two miles away. The lake would soon be filled with tornadic debris. Steel electric transmission towers were folded in half, severing Worcester's eastern connection to the Massachusetts power grid. As the tornado marched into the smaller community of Shrewsbury, it began a left turn moving in a more easterly direction. Rob Resch, located to the east on Route 9, took these photos of the tornado as it ate homes in Shrewsbury between Maple Avenue in Grafton Street. Rob was actually 300 feet lower in elevation than the town of Shrewsbury, which means that in this picture, he is literally looking upwards at the tornado. We're so accustomed to seeing tornadoes on flatter terrain that this picture almost doesn't look real. When the tornado finally lifted, it had been on the ground for nearly 50 miles, killing 94 and injuring 1,300, many of whom were in critical condition for days after the event. Debris from the event was everywhere. Wood from Flint was found found in Lake Erie, shingles from Worcester were found miles off the coast of the Atlantic. In an already unprecedented tornado season, this outbreak was the shot heard around the country, and there was a loud government and public response. In a survey done by the American Institute of Opinion, about a third of US residents in June of 1953 believed that the atomic bomb testing had some effect on the year's crazy weather and another 20% were downright unsure. And they weren't the only ones. Immediately after the Worcester disaster, Ray Madden, a Democratic representative from Indiana, demanded that the link between the atomic test and severe weather be investigated. And for a single day, James Van Zant, a member of the Joint Commission for Atomic Energy, actually agreed with him, then later retracted his statement. On June 23rd, a hearing was held with representatives from the Civil Defense, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, all of which denied any connection being observed between the atomic test and the severe weather. And truthfully, the Weather Bureau studies at the time supported that. What was lost on the public was the real threat, fallout. Americans were so enamored with the grand, fiery display and sheer explosive power of the atomic bomb that they didn't understand that the real threat doesn't come from the atomic bomb changing the weather, but rather the weather carrying radioactive particles from the atomic bomb to their neighborhoods. On May 26, 1953, tennis ball sized hailstones fell from a storm in the DC metro area, about 30 hours after an atomic cannon shell test at Frenchman's Flats in the Nevada test site. While rooftop gravel in the DC metro area measured about five times the normal background radiation, the large hailstones measured 30 times the normal background radiation. The position of the jet stream, the speed of the upper winds, and the time of the hailstorm all indicated that this was indeed fallout from the nuclear test. While the explosion didn't cause the hailstorm, the hailstorm carried the radioactive materials across the country. About a week after the tornado outbreak, in direct response to the national tragedy, the Weather Bureau formed the SELS, or Severe Local Storm Warning Center, which eventually moved from Boston to Kansas City. The outbreak caused the resignation of at least one forecaster, which honestly, 
is entirely understandable. And then Ted Fujita gets to the US, the Fargo tornado happens in 1957, and he publishes his landmark paper. This unbelievable three-day tornado outbreak was the defining moment in those gap years between Fawbush and Miller's tornado study and Dr. Fujita's groundbreaking tornado research. And it just so happens to be entangled in this geopolitical mess of what was the Cold War. There is still debate on whether or not the Worcester tornado should have been rated an F5. It was officially rated an F4, and that rating was reviewed by the National Weather Service in 2005. They could not find conclusive evidence to overturn it, and so they kept that F4 rating. I know that the rating does matter to a lot of people, especially the people from the area who were directly affected. The purpose of this video was not to make an argument for either case, but to look at the broader scope of the outbreak as a whole. Flint and Worcester rank as the 10th and 22nd deadliest tornadoes in US history, respectively, and the F4 that went through Cleveland was the strongest tornado to ever hit the city. $300 million in damage, 250 dead, all within that 36 hour window. This was a long one, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really appreciate you guys giving me the time to take longer on these bigger, more in-depth videos because they do really take virtually an entire month to make. If you wanna help me out, the best thing you can do is like and subscribe and you can comment your personal stories about this tornado outbreak below, or you can comment some suggestions on events that you wanna see me cover in the future. Hope you guys are having a great summer and I will see you soon.